Jesus is my guru, not my God. He used to be my God. I used to worship him as a God. I used to believe in him as a God. But something happened. Something changed. I had a shift in perspective on who Jesus is. And in this video, I'm going to be explaining what happened, why it happened, how it happened, why it matters, and how it's changed my life. Now, I just want to say from the very beginning that what I'm going to be sharing in this video is very controversial. It will be triggering for some. And so if this doesn't resonate with you, that's okay. That's fine. You are free to disagree. And so if what I'm saying is something that you just don't understand or you don't agree with, that's cool. And my encouragement to you would be uh, if you're open, if you're wanting to learn, if you're interested in some new ideas and perspectives, then don't even take what I'm saying to be true. Do your own research. Go back and do your own homework and study this stuff out for yourself and see what happens. A big part of my journey has been realizing that so much of what I've believed to be absolutely true, and I would never question it, and this is just the way it is, were things that were fed to me. It was indoctrination. It was programming, and I just accepted it. But when I started doing my own research, when I started thinking for myself, when I started spending time alone, and I started studying, and I started asking questions and, and, and having doubts and being okay with having doubts, that's when I started to experience the most transformation in my life. That's when I started to experience the most freedom in my life. And I think that truth and freedom are always kind of hanging out with each other. They're connected. So when you start getting into truth, you'll experience liberation and then vice versa. And so look for that. And, and sometimes that means getting away from the mainstream, getting away from what everyone else is saying, what everyone else is believing. I remember when I was in Christian fundamentalism, I grew up as a Christian and, and I was born Catholic. And then when I was around 11, my family left the Catholic church, became Protestant evangelical, got very involved with a church and, and, and became obsessed with the Bible and the whole Christian evangelical thing of dispensationalism, the whole belief of Jesus is coming back at, at any time. And so I was obsessed with that, with trying to get as many people saved as possible, trying to warn people about the end times and the rapture and the book of Revelation, and the Olivet Discourse, and Matthew 24, all these different things. And I was, of course, I was equating these biblical prophecies with current events and, and, again, warning people. That was my focus. That was my mission for the first 20-something years of my life. What I realized was that all of that, 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 that whole season of, of me being a Christian was me just believing things because everyone else around me believed in that. So everyone thought the same, everyone talked talk the same, and everyone believed the same. And I was hearing it every Sunday, and I was listening to it on TV, and I couldn't ask questions, I couldn't have doubts, I just had to accept whatever was being given to me because I had to trust the pastor, I had to trust the man behind the pulpit. He had the answers, and he has all these connections, the theologians and the scholars, and they've figured out everything, and they have all the the hidden truths, and they know the Bible better than anyone, so who are you to question? So that's what I went through, and that's what I experienced. And so, again, this was my reality. This was my world, and I really didn't know anything outside of that world. It's like, you know, imagine a fish that's born in a pond, and it's growing up, it's getting older, and it doesn't know anything else besides that pond. And so that fish believes that the world, that everything is that pond. But little does that fish know, there's actually many other ponds all around. And then there's also lakes and rivers and there's the ocean and there's all these other fish and there's different kinds of fish and they think differently and they believe differently and there's just different worlds, there's different systems. And so this is like, I've made a video one time called the matrix of religion. That's what it is. You're born into this matrix, you're born into this system and, or maybe not born into it, maybe you're persuaded into it either way, but you, you, you come into the system, you come into this consciousness, we could say, this, this, this group consciousness 
And you just think that this is the way things are. And there's this narrative that's presented to you. And you just believe that this is the narrative of humanity. This is the narrative of life. Oh, there was this deity. There was this God who created uh, the first two humans. And they sinned. They did something that they weren't supposed to do. They ate ate from a tree they weren't supposed to eat from. And then because of this, this thing called sin came into the world and it affected all of humanity. And now the only way that this God who's holy can be in relationship with sinful humanity is by the killing, by the sacrifice of uh, one holy righteous man named Jesus. Like that entire narrative that we're just kind of given and we're told that this is the way it is, you have to accept it, is something that, again, is just programmed. It's it, We just believe it and we don't question it. Why? Because we're taught that it comes from a Bible, it comes from a book that is a, a book that you can't question. We're taught that this book is inerrant, it's the Word of God, and don't, don't question that, don't research that, just believe that, and this is what it is. It's inerrant, it's univocal, it's authoritative, it's all these different things, and it's equal to God. It's God's word and God wrote every word. So, so it's, it becomes circular reasoning, right? Like, Hey, this is the truth. And the reason it's the truth is because our book says it's the truth and just accept it. And so anyways, I got to a point, I got to a point where I was like, you know what? Uh, this just doesn't sit well with me anymore. And I'm going to leave this pond and I'm going to explore some other ponds I'm going to leave the nest. Hey, the nest was helpful. I'm thankful for the nest. I experienced some spiritual development while I was in this nest, but it's time for this bird to fly. It's time for me to explore and to see what else is out there because maybe there's some other perspectives that have some meaningful truths to them. Maybe there's some other... Uh, ponds or nests that have something that would really resonate with me and, and, and something that I'm missing. And, and maybe the way forward is to transcend and include, as Ken Wilber says, instead of this group narcissism, instead of this whole mentality of we've got the correct religion, we've got the correct way, our book is the right way, everyone else is wrong, and if you don't believe like we believe, then you're going to hell or you're going to miss the rapture and you're going to have to go through years of tribulation on earth. You know, this this is us versus them mentality. Oh yeah, one of the main things I did when I was in college, and this was, a, this was during the time when I really started to question everything and I was rethinking my evangelical faith. I was going through this process of deconstruction and reconstruction. One of the things that I did was I did a church history study. And this was like the first time that I actually did a church history study. I didn't know anything about the early church. I didn't know anything about the first few centuries and all these really important councils and creeds and doctrines that were formed during these first few centuries that became the foundational pillars of what we call Christian orthodoxy. I didn't know any of that because as, as an evangelical, I probably heard it. I probably learned it when I was a Catholic growing up, but I was too young. I was a kid at that point, so I don't remember. But when I was an evangelical and when I was in ministry and I wanted to be a pastor, I wanted to be a theologian, I went to, I went through a pastoral internship. I was just in church all the time and I went to college and I, I actually have a bachelor's degree in theology and ministry. So, so but throughout that whole season of my life, I didn't learn anything about church history. I may have taken a course on it, maybe a class when I was in college. I don't remember, but it, it wasn't in depth. It wasn't what I really needed to understand. And again, it was, it was another teaching. It was another lesson that was through the filter of someone else's opinion. It was through the filter of the uh, evangelical approach or through some kind of teacher or professor or theologian in that world. And so it wasn't me just doing my own research, doing my own homework. But now I am, like I said, I start this church history study. And one of the things I learned that's fascinating is that for the first few centuries of the Christian movement, it wasn't even really called Christianity, it wasn't an established, organized religion. It was just 
the Jesus movement that was started. And then for the first three centuries, there was not a unified Orthodox church that just had like this creed or had some kind of uh, some kind of mission statement that all Christians believed in and adhered to. No, for the, for the first three centuries, there was not a singular Christianity. There were Christianities, plural. There were many different Christian groups who had different beliefs on many different things, like God and the the Mosaic Law. Should Christians still be following the Mosaic Law? And what does that look like? And a lot of different views on Jesus. Who was Jesus? And what did he really teach? And who did he really say he was? And all of this. And then we get to the 4th century, and there starts to be, among all these different Christian groups, there's one Christian group in particular that starts to gain in size and power, and they start to kind of become mainstream because they're growing in numbers, and they start to merge with the political power of the Roman Empire. And then by 4th century, 325 AD, we have the Council of Nicaea, and this is when they address the different views, the, the main views of Jesus that were circulating among the different Christian groups, and this is when they address the Arian controversy, and this is when Nicene Christianity really decides on the doctrine of the Trinity, and so Trinitarianism, the doctrine of the Trinity becomes established, it, it becomes formalized, it becomes systematized during this time, and this is when Jesus really becomes deified in, in a unique way, in a, in a very specific way through this Trinitarian lens. And after this point, once this, this one particular Christian group, once they start to merge with the political power of the Roman Empire, they become the mainstream, they're growing in size and power. All of a sudden, now this one Christian group becomes the quote-unquote orthodox church. Up until this time, all these different Christian groups who were kind of competing with one another, they were trying to be the one and only orthodox. They were trying to be the mainstream, but this is the church, or this is the, this is the group in Christianity, this one particular group, that won the race. And so to the victor goes the story. And this particular group, all of a sudden, now they have the power to determine what is right, calling it orthodoxy, and what is wrong, calling it heresy. And so then we get all these different polemic writings about all these other Christian groups. And we had polemic writings before this. This was popular when these different Christian groups were competing with one another to be the one orthodox church. But now it just it increases, and there's all these different... Uh, heretics that are named, that are demonized because they think differently, because they believe differently, and they have different views about Jesus. And so the Arian controversy for, for Arianism, which was led by Arius, it was the belief that Jesus was um, almost like below the, fa below the Father. And so Jesus was not equal to the Father. And so this is subordinationism. So, and there were verses that some of the Arians were using um, some some parts of scripture, I'll say, that they were using to kind of support their belief. And it's a belief. And you know what? That's There are scriptures that certainly allude to that, that the Father is greater than Jesus the Son. And Jesus even kind of says this in places. And so I'm not saying that that's, I don't believe in that. Like I'm not, I'm not, I don't adhere to any of the, the doctrines that have come out of early Christianity. But what I am saying is it's like, you know what? These were people, these were Christians that saw differently than the mainstream Trinitarianism that had become the mainstream. It wasn't the mainstream for the first few centuries. It, it grew in size and it became popular. This view that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are three in one and they're uh, equally God and, and, and Jesus and you got the Nicene Creed is, uh, is completely God. And, and so, so equal to God. And so you've got all these different views and they just disagree with one another. They disagree with one another. But now 
the anyone that goes against the mainstream, anyone that goes against the quote unquote orthodoxy that's being backed by the political power of the Roman Empire, which when I learned that, that was kind of suspicious. It's like, hmm, kind of strange, but okay. They're the ones getting to decide what's orthodoxy. Hmm. Anyways, so you have all these other Christian groups that are na- that are now starting to be deemed heretical and they're persecuted. And this is how the, uh, the church is growing. And so one of the things that we find in many traditions, this is not just Christianity. Christianity is the not one. Christianity is not the one exception for this. But one of the things we find in many traditions is there's some kind of teacher, some kind of enlightened being, some kind of mystic or sage or whatever that comes to, to the earth and they're they're preaching, they're teaching this profound revolutionary message that's um, being brought to the earth to uh, evolve, to uh, shift the collective consciousness of humanity with a message of love and peace. And it's revolutionary, so it's typically beyond the person's time. It's beyond the audience's time. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus had a message. I, I believe Jesus was a Jewish mystic. And I believe that much of what he said and what he taught was distorted over the years. Because like I said, this is this is something that happens that we see in other traditions where there's a teacher that comes that, that has a message, that has a profound, liberating truth that they impart to their audience, they impart to their followers. People are experiencing amazing things and miracles and healings and all this kind of stuff that follow the message. And then all of a sudden, that person, the leader, the teacher, the mystic, the sage, the saint, whatever it is, the enlightened being, the avatar, that person gets pedestalized and they get deified and they, uh, the followers start worshiping this person. Even if the person says, don't worship me, or they, they never say anything about being some kind of separate ultimate deity, which Jesus never did, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is what happens. The the followers of the person end up pedestalizing the person, and then years after the person lives, they come up with all these different theories and beliefs about, well, he actually said this, or no, it was actually this, or it was that, and then this is where we get all the, the disagreements, and this is really why Christianity was so split up. For the first few centuries, because you had all these different Christian groups, all these different Christian movements that were stemming from the one original movement started by Jesus of Nazareth, who, again, I believe he was a Jewish mystic, and I think there's a lot of support for this. Um, But yeah, so they start coming up with all these different things. And then by the third century, by the fourth century, I think that uh, when they started forming all the creeds and different doctrines and dogmas and it was like hey it turned into this whole religion and that's exactly what it became it became an organized and institutionalized religion and personally i don't think jesus ever wanted to start another religion i don't think that was his purpose i don't think that was his mission to to start another religion i believe he came to reveal a universal message as a mystic and the message was hey wake up to who you really are. The message was that the divine is in everyone and everything. And if you love your neighbor as yourself with the recognition that there is no separation between you and your neighbor, separation is an illusion, then that love, that awareness of unity, consciousness, oneness will transform the world. And you are the light of the world. He tells his disciples in Matthew 5 and all throughout the Gospel of Thomas that that they are the light of the world. And so obviously Jesus says, you know, in John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. And he says it kind of in the Gospel of Thomas, but he doesn't end with himself. He doesn't just stop with him being divine, him being the light of the world, him being whatever the I am. No, it's always beyond himself. Why? Because Jesus was a realized being. Jesus knew that he was one with God, like he said in in John 10, I and the Father are one. But even with that, he doesn't stop with just him being one with the Father, because in John 17, he prays like three or four times that 
the world and that his followers, his disciples, would experience the same exact oneness that he has with the Father. So whatever oneness he's claiming to have in John 10, he's praying, he's he's wanting the people around him, his audience, his followers, the world around him to experience, to realize that same oneness. And it's a realization. It's not an attainment. It's not an achievement. Like John 14, 20, Jesus says in that day, he's talking to his disciples, you will realize that I am in my Father, I am in you, you are in me. That is non-duality. That is unity consciousness. And of course, Jesus is a first century Jewish mystic, and so he's using language, he's saying all these different things through parables, through allegory, through symbolism, that had a lot to do with his Jewish culture. So his audience would have understood what he was alluding to, what he was pointing to at times. And again, this is first century, so... The language was different as far as like they Jesus wasn't using words like consciousness or he didn't have the quantum vocabulary that we have today that we use to point to these greater truths of reality. So no, what did he use? He didn't use literalism, but that's how most of his teachings and that's how most, most of his sayings are interpreted. No, he used the power of parable. He told stories. Why? Because this is what great teachers do. Great teachers realize that when you tell a story, it speaks directly to someone's heart. It goes beyond the finite analytical mind and it goes into the heart and that's where deep spiritual mystical truths are really understood and that's where the person is transformed in the heart space. And so this is what I started to, to realize as I would go back and I went to the original Jesus movement and I really started studying Jesus from this perspective of what we have in the canonical Gospels and in the Gospel of Thomas, which the Gospel of Thomas is something that I know many people have questions about and I've actually I've made some videos in the Gospel of Thomas and I'll put some of those videos in the description below. I do plan on talking more about it. And what I mean by that is just like, what is it? Why isn't it in the Bible? There's all these questions about it. There's skepticism around it, uh, of its authenticity and whether or not Jesus actually said these things. Much of what we read, much of the sayings, many of the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas are actually in the Synoptic Gospels. And the other thing is people... Some scholars have su suggested that the, the Gospel of Thomas was written later, like way past the uh, Synoptic Gospels, but I don't believe this is true. And again, I, I talk about all this in other videos, so if you haven't seen those videos, please go back and watch them. And I do plan on making more videos in the future discussing the Gospel of Thomas and how it's really helped me see who Jesus really is or who I believe Jesus is. Uh, really is or who he was and what he actually taught. In the Gospel of Thomas, there is no narrative. There is no uh, virgin birth and and um, death and resurrection and ascension like we find in um, the canonical Gospels. No, there's just, it's the, the Gospel of Thomas is literally just 114 sayings of Jesus and he's just kind of talking with his disciples. They're hanging out. They're asking him a bunch of questions, and he's answering, but he's answering in a very mystical way. And his words, his sayings are full of non-duality. They're full of these truths that, like I said, they go beyond the finite mind. They go beyond the dualistic mind. They're non-dual. They're coming from oneness. They're coming from this reality of no separation. Separation is an illusion, and we're all one, we're all interconnected, which is something that Jesus didn't come up with. We've, Jesus did not come up with. We find this in many of the other mystical traditions outside of Christianity, outside of Christian mysticism, which is a whole, that Christian mysticism is amazing. And that's is Christian mysticism was really the, the bridge for me out of Christian fundamentalism into where I am now. But anyways, we find this, this, oneness revelation, this truth of non-duality in Hinduism and many of the other Eastern traditions. And so, um, yeah, this is what Jesus was echoing as a mystic. He realized that he was one with God. And he says this 
in John 10, I and the Father are one. And some people, like I used to think that that was Jesus. There it is. He's claiming to be God alone. He's claiming to be some kind of superior deity or, or one with this superior deity that is separate from humanity, separate from creation, up there in the sky somewhere, the big man upstairs. That's how I used to interpret that because that's how I viewed God. But that was part of the problem. Part of the problem was my understanding of God, which again came from my indoctrination. It came from the programming that I went through growing up as a Christian fundamentalist and just from whatever was being said, whatever I was reading, whatever I was told. And I just, that was the language, the big man upstairs. God is up there. God is a, a man. God is a father. So that was something I've always questioned and just never really made sense. But that's what was believed. And, and maybe, you know, there are different takes on this and, and people, they say, oh, we're personifying. And, but that's a, that's a different conversation. Um, I do think using father or mother to personify God, to, per, to personify spirit can be helpful. It can be beneficial, but ultimately God transcends gender. God transcends uh, any kind of personification because God is beyond all of it. God is pure consciousness. God is pure, infinite, eternal spirit. Anyways, where was I going before that? Oh yeah, I was talking about um, the understanding God as some kind of separate distant deity. And that's what I grew up believing. That was my preconceived notion. But the mystical view of God is much different than the fundamentalist view of God. The mystical view of God is that God is infinite and eternal, so beyond time and space. And God is the infinite, eternal source of all life from which all of life, all of matter, all of the forces in the universe are emerging from, are arising from. And so nothing is separate from God. There's only God. God is all that exists and everything is arising, is a manifestation of the divine. That's how the mystics understand it. And, and what is taught is that you can directly experience God, which isn't something separate from yourself. Who you really are fundamentally beyond the body, beyond the mind, beyond the ego, beyond space, and beyond time is divine because that's all that there is beyond this 3D material world. Like I keep saying, beyond time and beyond space, there's just pure consciousness. Consciousness is not a byproduct of the material world. Consciousness doesn't come from the brain. It doesn't come from matter. No, matter and all the forces of the universe come from God, come from source consciousness come from the unified field or whatever you want to call it there's so many different names that we have that are coming from the finite mind they're just different concepts and ideas that the finite mind creates but all the names that we have are simply as they say in, in buddhism the finger pointing to the moon it's not the moon it's just pointing to that which is ineffable beyond conceptualization and so there's the Tao, the kingdom of heaven brahman um, unity consciousness, true self, the self, uh, all these different names, God. That you, but, you know, for me, the word God sometimes can be confusing, and especially for some of my viewers, some of my audience, because coming out of fundamentalism, like I said, God is some kind of separate deity. And that's what we believe. That's what I believe Jesus was. I believe Jesus Christ was God. God alone, in the sense of some kind of separate deity who was above all. And that's what many of his followers thought. But this is not something new. Again, we find this in other traditions where some kind of enlightened being with some amazing revolutionary message is later deified and pedestalized and worshipped by his or her followers and then a religion gets started in that person's name. And typically when a religion gets started in a person's name, the religion has nothing to do with what that, act, what that person actually taught and what they believed 
and what they stood for and why they came to the earth. And so I think this is exactly what happened with Jesus. And so moving from viewing Jesus as a God that is separate and distant from me to a, a teacher, a mystical teacher who, like I keep saying, brought this revolutionary message of non-duality, of oneness, of separation as an illusion that was beyond his time. And it it was, I believe it was so powerful. I believe it was so magnificent that his vibrational frequency that he brought to the earth, which was love one another, which was love your neighbor as yourself with the recognition that your neighbor is yourself, which was the kingdom of heaven is within you. Like that message, that the frequency of that message is still, it's still resonating. It, it's still going. It's still something that is very much alive. And that's why I think Jesus is arguably the most important, the most popular, the, po the most uh, revolutionary human being that's ever lived. But when we really study the life of Jesus and we really look into his teachings and we really, I think, approach it from this place of being open after we've gone through a season of unlearning and deconstructing and reconstructing, I think what we find is not someone who came to the earth to say, hey, I am God, worship me. In fact, Jesus never said, Jesus never told his followers to worship him. What he did say is follow me. And he lived a life of service to others. He said that he didn't come to be served, but to serve and he said that it was a very simple message, but it was also very powerful and profound. It was a message of peace and forgiveness and unconditional love and mercy and restoration and healing and all these truths that when we actually apply them to our lives and we actually view them and, and, and understand what they mean, then all of a sudden we are immensely transformed. And the world around us starts to be transformed because what we realize in this, in this way of life, is that it's full of light and that there actually is this inherent divinity, this divine light that is who we really are that's beyond the mind, beyond the ego, beyond the body, beyond space and beyond time. And this light starts to light up the world around us. It starts to shine. And what this light does is, is what this light does is it illuminates the reality of oneness. And so people around us start to see the inherent interconnectedness of all of life. And this transforms them. And so the light that's within them starts to shine. And little by little, the darkness fades, and this is when there is that collective shift in consciousness. And that quote-unquote new earth reality starts to become very real. It starts to become very available. And this is something that Jesus was all about. Jesus was all about bringing heaven to earth. He wasn't interested in bringing people up, in, up into heaven someday. No, he was wanting to bring this consciousness of heaven to the earth right here right now you know the pharisees are asking him in luke 17 20 through 21 they're saying jesus tell us about the kingdom where is it and and how when will it come to the earth and how will it come to the earth and what should we be looking for and all these different questions and jesus is like uh if anyone tells you to look for the kingdom out there somewhere don't listen to them why because the kingdom does not come with outward observation it's not up in the sky it's not out there it's actually within you the kingdom of god is within you and jesus's message was wake up to this and when you wake up to this then all of a sudden who you really are starts to starts to shine the light of your true self starts to shine and this good fruit that jesus talked about love peace joy mercy 
um, just being free and being authentic. This good fruit starts to flow out of your life naturally and effortlessly without you trying to be holy and righteous and spiritual because it's just who you really are. It's your it's your being, and you know, depending on what the what the tree is, that tree is going to produce a certain kind of fruit. And so, when you realize that that the root of your being is the vine, then guess what fruit you start to produce? Divine fruit. Fruits of the Spirit. That's just what happens. And that's what, you know, Jesus talks about. I'm thinking of, uh, where is it? Is it Matthew 11? Maybe? Yeah, Matthew 11, 28 through 29, where he says, Come to me, all you who are weary, all you who are burdened, and I will give you rest and uh, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Uh, you will find rest for your souls. All that you will find rest for your soul. What's he essentially saying there? What he's saying there is stop trying to to attain some kind of spiritual status. Stop trying to be holy. Stop trying to be righteous. No, because everything that you're searching for, everything that you're trying to attain and experience, is already an inner reality. And that word yoke can be read, it can be interpreted as union. My union, my oneness is easy. It's light. It's reality. It's right here. It's right now. Wake up to it. See it. Experience. Experience it. And then be transformed by it. I think that's what he's actually saying there. If you're tired, if you're worn out from religion and trying to figure out like what to believe in and which doctrine is the truth and who's got the right theology, like if you're tired of that whole world, that system, that old way, I'm inviting you into a new way. And in this new way, there is no way. There is no ladder to climb. It's all right here. It's all right now. It's within you. And fundamentally, it is you. And so Jesus is very aware of his, I think he had a mystical ex experience at some point in his life, probably early on, where he had self-realization of oneness with God, some kind of samadhi experience. And throughout the Gospels, you know, this is what we have to understand. When Jesus is teaching, when he's talking, um, he's speaking from this place of true self. He's not speaking from ego because he had transcended ego. He had transcended the sense of being a separate self. And that's why he says, he tells his disciples, he's like, hey, um, if you really want to follow me, you must deny yourself. That's the only way. And, and so what does he mean by that? Well, he's talking about the false self. He's talking about the ego. He's talking about who they thought they were as far as the disciples go. And what he's saying is if you deny the false self, if you deny the ego, then you can understand what, what I'm saying. Because what I'm saying is beyond the ego. It's beyond separateness. And so Jesus is speaking from this place of divinity, from this place of source consciousness, which is what he calls the Father. He's not when he when he's talking about the Father. I don't believe he's talking about some man that's his dad, like his biological dad in the sky. No, I think he's talking about the source of all life. I think he's talking about Brahman. I think he's talking about the Tao or or unity consciousness, whatever you want to call it. Like I said, the name doesn't really matter because it's just it's the finite mind coming up with names and ultimately God is beyond all names and so it's just we're pointing to that which is and so jesus is using the word father which i think like i said father or mother are both great words i think they're beautiful ways to personify the divine and they can be helpful for many people along the way and so that's what jesus is doing and so he's bringing this relational aspect to what God is, which I think is helping people bridge the gap from separation consciousness to unity consciousness, where there is some kind of connection, some kind of interconnectedness going on. And so he's calling God Father. But what does he say in John 14? What he says is that Everything that he's saying and doing is actually not him doing it. It's not the man. It's not the separate self, Jesus of Nazareth. No, it's the Father in him. And he's like, he's like, don't you know that I am in my Father and my Father is in me? Which is just a way of saying we are one. I mean, what else is he saying there? That's a, that's a way of, of 
speaking to the quantum reality that we would call the unified field or unity consciousness today, right? It's, it's, it's pure oneness. So he says, I'm one with God. God is in me. I'm in God. Don't you know that everything that I'm saying and doing is not actually me saying and doing it? I'm fully realized. I'm awakened. So it's, it's the life force energy. It's the source consciousness within me that is talking. And that's when he's making all these I am statements. He's speaking from this place of pure I amness, which is synonymous, we could say, with source consciousness, with God, with the Father, with Divine Mother. And he's speaking from that place. He's acting from that place. And he says, without this, without the Father in me, saying and doing everything I'm saying and doing, I can do nothing. Then he says, same chapter, John 14, this is John 14, 12, he tells his disciples that you can do the same things I'm doing and greater. Now, just before that, he says that everything he's doing is not him doing it, it's the Father in him. Then he tells his disciples that they can do the same things he's doing. Well, the only way that his disciples can do the same things that he is doing is if they have the same Father within them. And then this is what's revealed later on in that same chapter in John 14, 20, when he says, in that day, you will realize it's a realization. It's not an attainment. It's not something that we have to earn or it's not something that's separate from us that we have to try to get. No, he says, you'll realize, you'll wake up to this reality that I am in my Father, my Father is in me, and I am in you, which just all the I am in you, you are in me, that kind of talk, that kind of language, it's just another way of saying we are are one. What he's saying there is if you don't abide in this I amness, in the Father, in God, in Source, then you're going to live from ego. You're going to live from the illusion of separation. You're going to live in darkness. That's what living in darkness really is. It's living from the illusion of separation. And you will not live in the light. And the light is what you are. And this is when you'll experience the good fruit that is naturally the byproduct of your being, which is going to transform the world and um, be a very important part of this collective shift in the consciousness of humanity. That's essentially what he's saying there. And then like in the Gospel of Thomas, you know, it becomes very clear in the Gospel of Thomas that what Jesus is saying, the whole teaching, the whole message there is... Jesus is divine, yes, but so is everyone else. So are his disciples, so is every human being. The divine is not some separate, finite, mega being in the clouds. No, the divine is omnipresent. The, the divine is infinite. And all things, all the forces of the universe, all of matter is arising from the divine, is arising from source consciousness. It's not the other way around. Consciousness, awareness, is not a byproduct, is not coming from matter. No, matter and all the forces of the universe are arising from consciousness, which is the ground of, of being. It's the infinite sea of, of everything, and, and everything's arising from this nothingness, because that's what con consciousness is not a thing, it's not an object, it's pure nothingness, or as some of the mystics have described it as pure emptiness. But in this space of emptiness, there's infinite love. And so it's not like this, uh, we think of empty like in kind of a negative way, but it's, it's infinite and, and, and it's, it's actually love. It's actually this, uh, ineffable bliss, but it's just not a thing. It's not some kind of, uh, object or some kind of point that we can focus on because again it's infinite it's limitless and so anyways that's what the divine is and we find that in the gospel of thomas jesus is trying to awaken his audience he's trying to awaken his disciples to this reality of hey know who you really are he says when you know yourselves then you will be known and you'll realize that you are children of the living god which just means to be a child of god i think means simply to be divine to be a son of or a child of means um, uh, of the nature of. And so if you're a son of God or a daughter of God, that means you are of the nature of God. And so like in John 10, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, 
he's immediately accused of blasphemy by the Pharisees. And Jesus is like, well, wait, what do you mean? Uh, it literally says in your own scriptures, and he quotes Psalm 82, 6, he's, it says, it says in Psalm 82, Psalm 82, 6, that you are gods, you are sons of the most high God. And so he's like, why are you accusing me of blasphemy? Because I'm saying that I am a son of God. Again, to be a son of God just means to be divine. It means that the true nature is divinity. It's, uh, it's not ego. It's not human. It's not separate self. So that's essentially what Jesus is saying there. And so he's like, why are you accusing me of blasphemy for saying this when it literally says that that we're all gods, we're all divine. Now, when, when people hear this, especially coming from egoic consciousness, what it sounds like is that, oh, to say you're a god or to say that you're divine is that, you know, you're some kind of mega being in the sky, you're some kind of because that's the view of God from the ego. The ego always projects itself, which is separate, onto anything else it's perceiving, especially God. And then it equates God with its own preconceived notion of what God is. But that's not what God is. God is not some kind of being or object or, or deity in the sky. No, God is everything and nothing. God is, like I said, this nothingness, this emptiness, this source of all life, this mystery from which all of life is arising from and manifesting from, emerging from. And so when Jesus says that I am one with this, what he's saying is that he's not saying that he alone is this source. And then, of course, he's, he quotes Psalm 82, 6. He says, no, we're all divine. We're all living and in, in, in having our, our beingness in the one infinite being, God's being. God is not a being. God is being itself from which we have our being. We live and move and have our being in, which is what it says in Acts 17. And then um, God is not like this, this entity that exists. No, God is existence itself. God is the ground of all being. That's what the that's the mystical approach to God. And as a first century Jewish mystic, I believe this is what Jesus realized, and this is what he's trying to say. And so this is in, like I said, John 10, Jesus makes this statement: I am one with God, I am one with the Father. They accuse him of blasphemy, because to be equal with God or to say you're God, that at that time was absolutely blasphemy. In the Jewish tradition. And so, um, but Jesus doesn't, the thing is, he doesn't just stop with himself because like I said, in John 17, he prays three or four times that his disciples in the world would experience the same exact oneness that he was claiming to have. And so if Jesus was claiming to have the oneness with God in the sense of him alone being God, or in the Trinitarian sense, which is still some kind of separate uh, divine deity that's separate from humanity, separate from creation, above creation, if that's what he's saying in John 10, then it doesn't make sense for him to pray and want the world, everyone else, to realize the same oneness that he has with the Father. If that's what he, because it, no, it just, it wouldn't make sense. But if we view the, if we view the divine, if we view Father, if we view God is something much bigger than that, something much more mystical than that, something that's beyond the finite mind, something that's infinite, something that's eternal, something that's beyond space and time and the body and the material world and, and all of this, then it starts to kind of make sense. And then as we go within, and this is the gospel of Thomas, this is the message in Thomas, as you go within, you discover that the kingdom is within you and it's, out, and it's outside of you, which is, is just another way of saying it's non-dual. And like he says in saying 113 of the Gospel of Thomas, he says the Father's kingdom is spread all over the earth, but people just can't see it, right? So um, it, it, it's, it, it all goes back to essentially egoic consciousness and awakening to your true self. If we're living from ego, if we're living from this, this 
place of being a separate self. We're never going to get it. We're going to miss it. We're going to live from separation, which is going to lead to all this negative behavior that stems from separateness. But as we shift into oneness, when we realize that we are one with God and that there is no separation, then that means we're one with our neighbor. And that is going to have a tremendous impact on how we're treating our neighbor. Because what we're going to, what we're going to realize through unity consciousness is that what we're doing to our neighbor, we are doing to ourselves. And this creates a life of love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness and peace and kindness and all these amazing things, which Jesus fully embodied. But as a, as a guru, instead of as a God, what I, what I started to learn from Jesus was that, and this is really the hallmark of any great teacher or guru or sage, what they're doing is they're not saying, I'm special, I am alone, I, am, I alone have some kind of divine authority or divine status. You don't, you're less than. I am, you know, this, that, and the other. Worship me, and I have all the answers, I have the truth, and just do what I say. No, that's not what a true teacher or a true guru does. What a true teacher, what a true guru actually does is they don't say that like I am it and you know I'm special and I'm I have this divine authority and I'm the only way that you can experience or encounter God. No, what they do is they point to God in you and they encourage they're leading you to experience the divine truth for yourself through this method through this modality of direct experience, which typically comes in the form of meditation or some kind of uh, contemplative prayer. But this is what we find predominantly in the Gospel of Thomas, which is why the Gospel of Thomas has become my favorite gospel, my, my one of my favorite books, because we're really getting this side of Jesus from this profound uh, view of, of him being a, a wise guru who's not trying to get people to worship him as God, but what he's saying is, hey, whatever I have, whatever I can do, you can do the same, which again, we find that in John 14, 12. And like I said, the only way that's possible is if whoever Jesus is talking to has the same divine nature or the same source consciousness within them that's able to do all these things that he said were possible. But there's a saying in, in the Gospel of Thomas, I think it's saying 24, where Jesus' disciples are asking him, they say something like, Jesus, tell us where you really are because we need to, we need to seek you and find you. And, and Jesus completely flips the question. And his response is, it just doesn't seem like it aligns with what they're asking or with, with what they're asking. And again, you know, Jesus knew that his disciples were coming from a certain level of consciousness, mainly egoic consciousness, and and mainly through literalism. And so he flips it and he says, um, they ask him, they say, where are you really, Jesus? We need to seek you. We need to find you. And Jesus says, there is light within a person of light, and that light shines throughout the whole world. And so it's like, wait, like, that doesn't really answer the question. But maybe it does, because maybe what Jesus is saying is you're asking about where I really am. Okay, well, you have to understand that I, who I really am, is not this body that you're looking at. And it's not this man, this man, this name, Jesus. It's not this persona. It's not this separate self. It's not this ego. No, I'm actually beyond all of that. I am light. I am consciousness. And this is not separate. It's not superior to you. It's actually equal to who you really are. It's one with who you really are. It is who you really are. I am the light of the world, yes, but so are you. And if you go within yourself, beyond the ego, beyond the body, beyond the mind, and you discover that place within yourself that is purely divine, that is light, and I go within myself, beyond the body, beyond the ego, beyond the mind, and I enter into that space of pure divinity, which is light, 
then there's only one of us. We are together in pure oneness, in love. That is what this non-dual reality is. And so Jesus says, if you want to find me, then go within yourself. That's where I am. Why? Because I am you. I am one with you. There is no separation. In that day, you will realize that I am in my Father. You are in me. I am in you. We're all one. There is no separation. And he's praying multiple times in John 17 that this is the realization that the world would come to. So I think this is the, like I said, the hallmark of a revolutionary teacher, of a mystic who's not trying to pedestalize himself. He's not trying to put himself on some kind of divine platform. He's never, he never said, worship me. Never. And he didn't write anything either. So we don't have any writings from Jesus. And this is something else I've thought about too. It's like, well, wait, if if Jesus really wanted humanity to know exactly who he is and the only way humanity could be saved from their sin and you know enter into heaven and avoid hell and all this kind of stuff was if they believed in Jesus to be the one and only son of God and, and God alone and all these different things that have come from the religion of Christianity, these conditions of what you have to believe in and what you have to adhere to, if this is what Jesus really wanted the world to know so that the world could really be saved, which that whole narrative that we find of this idea that humanity is inherently sinful because of a man named Adam eating from a tree that he wasn't supposed to eat from, and now we all have original sin. If we and if, if we're not saved, if we're not born again, then we're going to hell. Like that whole narrative is is part of the message that was created years after Jesus lived, when the Christian religion was being formed, and that became the 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 message of mainstream Christianity. But it almost became like a big sales pitch, like, hey, you're inherently sinful. You have something wrong with you. You have some kind of spiritual disease. And if it's not taken care of, if if you don't put your faith in Jesus because of what he did for you, then you can't be with God, then you go to hell. And so that became the message. But that, that whole narrative, Jesus never talked about that. Jesus never said that he came to die for the sins of humanity. He never talked about all these different... Um, atonement theories and he never said you know make me your lord and savior he never said say this prayer he never said no he never said any of that but we just accept it we just believe it like i said it's part of the indoctrination it's part of the programming it's part of the conditioning jesus never said it but what he what he what he did say was love one another just as i have loved you what he did say was forgive 70 times 7 what he did say was be peacemakers and what you're doing to all these other people that you think are separate from you you're doing it to me you're doing it to yourself so love your neighbor as yourself because your neighbor is yourself there is no separation there jesus was a non-dual legend who came to awaken the collective consciousness of humanity. And this is something that there's a ripple effect effect going on. It's still happening. It's still, I think, very much alive in the movement, although it's not mainstream. This mystical movement of Christianity has been in existence. And like I said, the Christian mystics have really helped me. I spent a lot of my time when I was walking out of fundamentalism, reading the Christian mystics, I was going to these different monasteries and I was spending time with the Christian mystics. I was feeling their presence. I was feeling the presence of the saints and what they carried and just the oneness because guess what? They're within me as well. They're within you. We're all one. So you can actually tap into that. You can actually experience the presence of certain sages and teachers and mystics and whoever you want, any any being that you want. You can actually experience and and learn from them and 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 talk to them and 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 just appreciate them and honor them and so anyways this has been a lot longer than i wanted um so i apologize for that but i just feel like there was so much to be said and so i'll conclude with this viewing jesus as a guru was something that absolutely liberated me from the dogmatic conditioning of having to make him some kind of deity that I had to worship and fear because, again, he never said any of that. 
in my opinion. Again, you can believe what you want. You're free to disagree. But I think there is something to a teacher that is pointing out the truth in you. They're not telling you what to think. They're teaching you how to think. They're encouraging you to go within your own self and do your own investigation, your own examination of yourself. You know, Jesus says, like in the Gospel of Thomas in saying three, he's encouraging his disciples to know who they really are because essentially what he's saying is when you know yourselves, then you'll be known and you'll realize that you are divine. You'll realize that that the true essence of who you are is beyond anything you can think or imagine. It's beyond the material world. It's beyond space and time. It's beyond it all. And it is fundamentally one with source consciousness, with the Father, and it's timeless. So it doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end. And that's why Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. This pure I amness is one. Your I amness is one with my I amness. And there's only one I amness. So we all share in this one I amness, this, this pure awareness. And meditation is the best method. And I believe Jesus was definitely meditating, especially as a Jewish mystic. When he would go off into the wilderness or he'd go off uh, on a mountain for like 12 hours straight or however long it was, I don't think he was up there just praying to the Father, praying to some deity, like in the sense of um, um, uh, prayer in the form of petition. No, I think he was either experiencing some kind of contemplative prayer or he was in meditation, probably in samadhi, experiencing some kind of mystical, some kind of incredible experience of of oneness, of, of bliss, of transcendence. And then he would bring that. He would come down from the mountain with this radiance, with this light. He was glowing full of his divinity. And that's why he was able to do all these amazing things. That's why he was transforming the world around him. Now, the the religious elites of his time didn't like this, but that's the paradigm. That's what we see time and time again. And I believe this is what Jesus came to challenge, and this is what he became. This is what he came to highlight and reveal. You know, you know, to show humanity these different patterns of of ego and group narcissism and us versus them mentality, which is all rooted in separation consciousness. So the the ultimate goal, like I keep saying, the ultimate message as a guru, as a teacher, as a sage, as a mystic was to shift us from separation, which was the old way, into the new way, enlightenment, which is just the way it's always been we've just been unaware of it and that is oneness that is unity consciousness so there was one more thing i was going to say but i can't remember and i don't want to keep talking because i know this video has been long enough so that's where i'm at in my journey and uh i'm really enjoying it i really feel like it it resonates with where i'm at i feel like i um am encountering the presence of Jesus and and this is what's being highlighted to me and and uh, again it's evident by the fruit Jesus says you'll know them by their fruit and I feel like this fruit of of peace and and joy and uh, just honoring every human being knowing that the divine is within every human being and, and that there is no separation and it's moving me past my old ways of egoism and group narcissism and and spiritual egoism and and all the things that come with this old system all the different doctrines and teachings that are based in fear like all of it like it's 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 got me out of that and it's it's brought me into this this new world, this 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 kingdom, this kingdom of heaven that's right here, that's right now, and it's accessible within me. And and I've read all this. I, I grew up, like I said, reading the scriptures, but it wasn't a direct experience for me. It wasn't something that was part of my inner world. Therefore, it wasn't a part of my outer world. But now it is. And this shift happened again when I became aware when I had an awakening experience of my own divinity. And then that 
enabled me to see and experience and understand Jesus and how he's actually teaching and speaking and being from his true being, which is source consciousness, which is divine. And until you make that shift, it's just, it's so hard to interpret. There's always going to be some kind of interpretation that's coming through the lens of egoism, which typically involves some kind of fundamentalism, which typically involves some kind of separation. And so that's why there's this pattern and paradigm of, like I said, the teacher, the mystic, the sage, the avatar, the enlightened being. Some people think that Jesus is a reincarnation of the Buddha. I'll leave that up to you to, to decide and think about. It doesn't really matter. But anyway, so that being, that person, that leader gets pedestalized. They get worshipped. They get turned into a deity. A religion is started in their name. And you get all these different denominations and disagreements on so many different things over time. That's just the nature of it. That's the pattern of it, especially in this branch of fundamentalism among the various traditions. But I think if we move beyond all that, I think it's simple. I think it's right here. I think it's right now. I think the present moment is where God is because the present moment, the eternal now is all that exists. I believe the kingdom of heaven is within each and every one of us. I believe Jesus the Christ is within each and every one of us, and we can awaken to this Christ consciousness, and we can be transformed by it, and we can start to see a major shift in the collective consciousness of humanity from that of separation into that of oneness, into that of unconditional love and peace and joy and bliss. So... I guess that's it. Um, I'm sure there's other things I was going to say, but can't think of them now. So that's it for today. I would love to hear your thoughts on this one because I know there's going to be a lot of uh, different ideas and uh, probably disagreement, which is okay. It's cool. Again, you're free to disagree. So I want to hear your thoughts, comments, questions. Leave them in the comment section below. And if you found this video helpful, informative, or insightful, please leave a thumbs up at the bottom of the screen. And be sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.